Dedicated to us, we're all falling apart. <laughs> it's true, it's happening, isn't it? Extreme ways are back again. Extreme places I didn't know. Great. I broke everything new again. Everything that I don't. I threw it out the windows, came along. Yeah, we did go. We did go. Extreme ways I know. Can you hear me now? One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three, four. Extreme ways that help me, that help me out late at night. Cool, we extend to each other. Extreme places I had gone, but never see any light. Dirty basements, dirty to the palace. Dirty places coming through. The world, Extreme the palace home. and cremation Did ground, all at the same man. place. I would stand in line for this. There's always room in life for this. So many places, so many heartaches, so many faces, so many dirty 
things you couldn't even believe I would stand in line for this It's always good in life for this Impermanence. <laughs> Impermanence sounds nice and contained, doesn't it? <laughs> oh, it's just, uh. So here we are. You can close your eyes. And we've been uh, exploring <coughs> in a tenacious and fixated manner the topic of fixation. Huh? And today we're, we're going into desire becomes fixatedness. Huh? <coughs> How desire becomes fixatedness. <coughs> and if you guys extend to me, I will give a better talk. We'll extend to each other. Raise, raise the intensity of the field. And it's true. The manifestation of awareness is us. And there's Awareness manifests as us. It also dissolves as us. Huh? That's why more or less, hopefully more, we're establishing ourselves in the Vajrakamara or the Vajrakalaya, the unborn, undying, primordial awareness, which is our own awareness. <coughs> So we'll focus in, lean into each other. And we've been following the, uh, Penam Rinpoche's teaching huh? that fixation is the problem. And we'll always will have problems. And yet fixation undetermines our experience of the awareness field. Huh? We're hanging out. And so today we're going to go another step further, but in the field and ex focusing on desire. We've looked at this from different ways, especially the undeterminedness of experience. And the first phrase would be the welcome, good to see you guys, howdy, the mentalization of desire. And from this frame, the mentalization of desire can be a very tricky, tricky experience. So to experience desire, to experience desire, the entire range, it is, or to experience true desire, it's best really, really best not to have desire located in our mind completely. Therein arises fixation. A dog howling. It's really best not to have desire located in the mind alone. And the mentalization of it and the word mentalization have different connotations, but the way we're using it here can make true desire impotent. I'm not about sexual desire alone at all, but it takes out it takes the potency away from desire itself. It becomes impotent and fragmenting and without resource. So the more the desire is simply in my mind, the more fragmented and the it will have no potency f for me. The very manifestation of primordial awareness is the manifestation of desire. 
That is really a key issue of the Vajrayana. The very manifestation of awareness huh, is the manifestation also of desire. And desire itself is the manifestation of primordial awareness. And the history of Buddhism or the history of any ism, history of uh, Hinduism, we have a lot of variations on this theme. I'm not necessarily agreeing with each other at all. So I'm giving you a very opinionated approach, like I always do. Desire in the mind alone becomes a metaphor of hope and hopelessness. When desire is in my mind alone, when it's no longer here, it becomes the metaphor of hope and hopelessness. Hey, welcome. Glad to have you here. And desire can become separated from psyche, can become separated. <clears throat> so I'm going to start over again. Glad to have you guys here. We've been following Penham Rinpoche's teaching, very great, great Dzogchen master, that fixation is the problem. That there's always going to be problems, always problems, always problems. But fixation is the problem in that it undetermines, undermines our experience of the awareness field. Then you really are in a sea of problems. So the first, and desire is not easy to be understood, so it's always, it's a very uh, concealed topic. And the first statement, as we hold it together, is the mentalization of desire. And to experience true desire, which itself is quite a, is this my desire? Is this your desire? Huh? Whose desire is this anyway? In me. Is best, really best, not to have desire located in the mind alone. And mentalization, where it's just in my mind, thinking, huh, can make true desire impotent and fragmenting, and it's cut off from the resource. When desire is in my mind alone, it is dissociated, it is cut off from psyche. Call it, with you will, psychic fe field, whatever phenomena. Huh? The very manifestation of primordial awareness is desire. That is part of the understanding of the Vajrayana. Desire as path. And how to understand that. How to work it skillfully, smartly, and not stupidly. <laughs> this is another question. The very manifestation of primordial awareness is the manifestation of desire. And desire is the manifestation of awareness. Just to feel that and to know that is really great. And also knowing that the manifestation is this close with disintegration, appearing and disappearing, appearing and disappearing, coming and going. So desire in the mind alone becomes a metaphor for hope and hopelessness. <clears throat> and I had the good fortune well, of spending a year studying hope and hopelessness in Belgium when I was studying phenomenology for years. We did a year study. Basically, I was interested in hope and hopelessness. <coughs> so was the Ahold Institute at that time. Because <coughs> it sounds so good to have hope. So if desire in the mind alone, when it's in my mind alone, you can feel it for yourself. I start thinking about I start entering hope or hopelessness. And I start going, oh, this, is, this desire is good. This is really good. But it's, it's really improbable. It's really improbable. It's probably not going to happen. <laughs> Here's something very terrible. Very terrible. You know, my desire is that it doesn't happen. And it's highly probable. Oh, here's 
something I desire so much. I've desired it my whole life. And now it's becoming probable. Wow. Oh boy, that is. You know, something happens and now it's becoming improbable. And so uh, in the hope, hopelessness <laughs> continuous, why the yogis was urged to get beyond hope and hopelessness. Get beyond hope and hopelessness. And you know, how can this be? Why? Hope is so good, huh? So when we enter into our mind alone, we enter into, into future orientation. As soon as you have a desire, have one, any one you want, it will come into some form of future orientation. Maybe will, maybe won't. It will come into some form of probability. It becomes a cognitive factor. Cognitive psychology knows this, likes it. Huh? You guys follow this topic? You start having a scale in your mind. You, all these, if you look at minds, they're like little scales. You know, desire scales. Probable, improbable. Yes. It will start out with a lack, usually. Yeah. Desire arises out of lack. So the first thing is thinking that just the mentalization of desire just in my mind alone, I'm going to get more and more fixated. More. Do you ever have this experience of getting fixated <laughs> in your mind? And then suddenly all the res- psyche herself just disappears. There's no more psyche. There's no more field. There's no more resonance. There's no more resonance. Because actually true desire in the body has fantastic resonance. It has real power. But in the mind alone, you're left with sheer will, cleverness. That's the first thing, just to think about it when you have nothing to do. <laughs> the second thing on desire, I'm, I'll come back in a bit, I'm just give you the whole little picture. The second in desire, and this is really from the psychoanalytic frame, who's investigated s- desire, and also the yogis in all the traditions. Desire is a big thing in yogis, right? Desire. How to understand desire. How to work with it. And so here, desire is a function of the desire of the other. <clears throat> this is Lacanian. A very useful understanding and also in Freud and also in some of the yogis. Actually, to know your own desire is an accomplishment. Uh, what do I really want? What do I really, really want? Do I really want to be here or not be here? Why am I here? Is this my desire or your desire? So our own desire can easily become the desire of the other. Have you ever noticed that? That your desire can become the desire of the other? Have you ever noticed that? Raise your hands if you notice it. It just helps it. Suddenly, you have a desire, and now it's the desire of the other. It may have been that way your whole life. You have a desire, and suddenly, it's not really my desire. Or your desire is a function of the desire of the other. My desire may be a function of your desire. The dogs howl again. Or your mother's desire or your father's desire, or particularly institutionalization you've been through, that desire. When it's institutionalized, it also becomes the law. Are you with me? Then you've got, it's a function of the other and the law at the same time. Then you enter into subjugation. <clears throat> so our own desire can be marked by the desire of the other. This is a special it happens in friendship and in close relationships or in a th- wherever there's hierarchy, it will happen. That covers a lot of territory, doesn't it? <laughs> and there's your dog. <laughs> so is this my desire or is my desire a function of the other's desire? You can actually ask yourself this question every day. And secondly, your desire can awaken my desire. 
you know, we often think of this in terms of sexual terms, and that's just one <coughs> obvious manifestation, but it can be across the, the realm, huh? You guys following this? So my desire can also awaken you, your desire, huh? That's, God, we all want this, whatever this is. Oh, now I want it. Because it's in the field, huh? We transmit all the time to human beings. We transmit desire, we transmit light, we transmit our minds. Which really becomes a thick porridge after a while, right? Is this the desire of my mother? Hmm. My father? Desire the institution? Is this the desire? Is this what God wants from me? Often interpreted by some other, huh? Let me tell you what God wants from you. Your <laughs> dharma. Please tell me my dharma, please. And that usually becomes the law or someone who is the law in your mind. This is not unpleasant <laughs> in a strange sort of way. It's like you can take off. You can become unconcealed. Who's to have your own desire clearly is quite an accomplishment. As a subject, and subject has two plays on the word subject, right? The subject is the experiencer, the agent, the knower, and subject is also the subject of. You know, <laughs> so the, as subject, I can be subject to the demand of others. Have you felt that? That you are subject to the demand of others, huh? The power of the other, the wish of the other. It's not even spoken, but you read it very well. Dogs are howling again. Or even the imagined desire of the other. The imagined desire of the other. Now you combine that desire of the other and the law, whatever the law means to you. The law, put those two together, the desire of the other and the law. And your own subjectivity can become subjugated. You're now in subjugation. The moment of freedom, and now you're subjugated. And you can live in subjugation out of fear. Out of fear. Fear of abandonment. Fear of cruelty. Fear of heaven. Fear of hell. Fear. This is not good. <clears throat> Makes you want to give up desire. <laughs> Complicated even, desire can be a function in the generational field. You know, we tend to, the generational field is very real, and I'm an expression of, of mine, and you're an expression of yours. So desire floats and is transmitted in the generational field. And desire can also be situated within the unfolding of your family system. We all know that, huh? Your position influences. And the position in the system can organize your desire. Huh? Yeah. If you're the older, caring sister in a sister, in you'll probably be really have that desire to to care a lot, so much that you could disappear. So the history of desire, according to some, is concealed. I think I like that statement that the history of desire is concealed. What is my desire? What do I really desire? And foreclosed, even foreclosed from my own self. Tell me what to do, please. You know? <laughs> in early Vedanta, and early Buddhism especially, and more or less in spirituality, desire is the source of suffering. In fact, we just went through desire as a source of suffering. Did you feel a little suffering as we went through that? I did. So desire is the source of suffering, right? You've heard that before, right? 
in Nirvana, or they say it in the Pali scriptures, Nirvana. I like Nirvana better than Nirvana. Nirvana sounds fun to me for some reason. <laughs> it has a little rhythm to it, Nirvana. Nirvana sounds flat. I don't know why. Okay, <clears throat> But I have a lot of time in my hands to, <laughs> to wrestle with these things. So Nirvana or Nirvana is to be free of suffering, which is to be free of desire. You want to be free? Be free of desire. So the desire is for you to have no desire. Okay. <coughs> and at times, there can be a foreclosure of desire. You want to keep the door closed. A lot of people try and keep the door closed on desire. Are you with me? In the day, then at the darkness. So the foreclosure of desire as we know can cause lots of problems for people, huh? Lots of right hand not knowing what the left hand is doing, left hand not knowing, wanting to know what the right hand is doing, and a lot of difficulties arise with the foreclosure of desire. Mm -hmm. Because this nihilistic Injunction and that in framing, neti neti, from this point of view, not this and definitely not that, is actually foreclosing the experience of the manifestation of primordial awareness itself. Just think about it. Don't believe this whatsoever. But as you foreclose desire, see no evil, hear no evil, feel it, just get it out of here, you're actually foreclosing the power of the arising of primordial awareness itself in you, which is itself such a challenge, huh? Just to stay with it and experience desire as it arises in your body with its intensity and fire because ultimately desire is the elements arising, manifesting, and to hold it in your awareness stream itself can help bring you into liberation. Isn't that amazing to think that way? So Long Chimpa thinks that way. Words and meaning. The foreclosure of desire. Yeah. So <clears throat> since the manifestation... And it can actually foreclose the primordial manifestation in range and multidimensionality. Sex is a really good one. Sex. I'm going to foreclose this component here. You know? And in foreclosing that energy, one starts foreclosing the energy. One starts foreclosing the unfolding of the Kundalini Shakti, right? Or it just doesn't stay in the body whatsoever. It goes into fantasy. It takes, other than going up the other main channel, it goes to another channel, and the one has a preoccupying, ongoing, never-ending narrative. The eternal narrative. It's, it's always there. Nothing happens. It's just, a, I would if I could. Probability improbable. But that narrative, huh? Foreclosure, in the mind, fixated states. Yeah. How, how to hold desire, right? How to hold desire. How to hold it. How to, how to bring it forth and live within the manifestation of primordial awareness. Recovering the dark side first. Since the manifestation of awareness is the manifestation of desire, the very foreclosure of desire indirectly implies, for some, the foreclosure of the Namanakaya dimension, which is the world 
and the world is the world of desire. There's no question in my mind at least that this place is a place of desire. <laughs> all stars, all types just running around. And you know. So we just don't think the Manakai exists, never did, and then relieve ourselves just being in Dharmakaya. <clears throat> Desire created Baltimore. I don't know why I say this so much, but it, it gives me enormous pleasure to think that desire created Baltimore. It even gives me great pleasure to think that de desire created me. I love knowing that I came into this world out of desire. You did too. You came out of desire. All the great traditions arise out of desire. Unfolds out of desire. So the foreclosure of desire, that's it. Neri neri. <coughs> and I've seen this place as rich as really. The more it's foreclosed, <coughs> the more it's out there. <coughs> Whatever the, it is. <coughs> so this dissociation of desire, foreclosure of desire, creates within the personality. It can create dissociative states and the personality self becomes dissociated from a certain type of vitality and energy. And it can also re result in internalization of nihilism, like just a nihilistic frame, you know, not a happy camper. And a kind of emptiness of person and the, the word emptiness has a long range of history in, in both Buddhism and in Hinduism from my highly prejudiced point of view. The word sunyata has a lot of different meanings depending on how it was spoken, where it was spoken. And in certain times, emptiness means emptiness, just nihilism. You're just the mind, there's causality, and that's it. In other formulations, emptiness becomes, huh? The Pajma Parahata, it becomes potential. It, be, it becomes divinity itself unfolding, you know, manifesting. It becomes the great mother. It becomes radiant light, radiant openness, huh? manifesting everything. Huh? So it depends on how. But if you're holding it in that point of view, it is really hard to, to, uh, to foreclose experience. You have to kind of ride it and experience it, and learn to tolerate it. You actually have to learn to suffer the experience of desire. You have to suffer the experience of desire, up to a point. You have to really learn to hold it, be in it, feel it, huh? and watch what unfolds. <coughs> They're actually in the little journal two very good papers on this. It's not exactly on this. One is on sublimation as the, the expanding of light in the human body, which is a function of working with desire. And the other one, the, the, was, we forget so soon, the, the expansion of the kundalini is using that language, huh? And what it means to have, why, the f why desire works that and how to hold desire in awareness itself. So we're just almost done here. So an emptiness. So the early teachings sometimes on emptiness <clears throat> were not necessarily the unfolding of potential space, especially as in, in the later Mahayana and Vajrayana. And with this, you can start experiencing the lack of self. And you can start experiencing, as I look around the room, there's no self in this room. And there's no subjectivity. Okay. So there can be a rising out of the very negation of desire. The negation of subjectivity. I'm giving you a highly prejudiced point of view. 
you start negating desire, foreclosing desire, foreclosing attachment, foreclosing bondedness, foreclosing this world, you will then start foreclosing subjectivity, which is the self. Because then you start having the foreclosure of self, the foreclosure of subjectivity, and that becomes a no-no. No self. I think I see a self. See bodies? Can you see a self? Can you see subjectivity? Can you see openness? Can you see openness in a being? Can you feel openness? You're not going to see a, a little homunculus in there. So, that, so sometimes you might see a little blue person. But that's a beautiful symbol of the openness. So the negation of subjectivity is a negation of the manifestation of primordial awareness manifesting in yourself and everybody you know and love. You don't have to believe any of this. The self as subjectivity is negated. The doorway of the light is negated. No subject. Non-self is non-subjectivity. And a lot of this is an attempt <coughs> to try and get beyond subject and object. If you have no subjectivity, you have no objectivity, in some sort of way you can find yourself in a non-dual state. This subjectivity that's eradicated, and people try and eradicate subjectivity, in themselves all the time. Tota tibi domine. I give myself to you, oh my Lord. Tota tibi domine. And it leaves an empty person without agency, without self direction, without authority. And actually, it, it can negate the disclosure of the inner guru. It can negate the disclosure of the innermost guru, which arises in you as your own self. That is really why it's really great to practice being the deity, being the guru, I don't necessarily mean thinking of the little ornaments, which all have hot, powerful, symbolic meanings. But you want to see through the eyes of the deity and see through the eyes of the guru as your eyes seeing that world. You guys awake? Hang on. So it's subjectivity eradicated leaves an empty person, a shell. And subjectivity itself can become organized within a nihilistic frame of reference, huh? There's no I in me. The I-ness of I. Aham, ah. Aham, ah. I'm becoming what I am. Aham. Inner heart mantra. Aham. White Tower Prayer, Aham, I am. Subjectivity is primordial awareness manifesting within in your own body and your mind in a particular time and space. Subjectivity, the big O, 
that openness is subjectivity. Subjectivity is not a thought. It's not an affect. It's not even a memory, thank God. Huh? <laughs> it is the openness of primordial awareness manifesting in you, as you, and around you. So, whoever you love, whatever you love, If you love that being, you are in love with primordial awareness itself. Mm. Mm. And to experience that in that person, It has to be in you, or you cannot experience that in the other. The primordial openness of the great expanse in you, as you, and subjectivity is the primordial awareness in you, as you in the mind-body continuum, which slowly but surely, though it's totally obvious, it's not so obvious, it has its own concealment that as we experience it, we truly realize that God dwells within us as us. If you want to use theistic language, or primordial awareness, if you want to use non-theistic language. The opening and the light of awareness within you is the beingness of your own being manifesting. And it is the Vajrakamara, here and now, not then, not deep, deep within you, hidden, completely hidden. That's why the great cities, it's totally obvious once you start to glimpse that. There's a transmission beyond words and letters. It doesn't belong to any tradition. It's the very nature of human awareness and that is the Buddha, Bodhidharma. So subjectivity is a floating metaphor. We're almost done. Sometimes we have to think a bit. Subjectivity is a floating metaphor. For some, it's mind alone. For many people, subjectivity is their mind alone. Perhaps for you, for a while, subjectivity was your mind alone. Or even worse, your thinking function. Or even worse, your judgmental function for many of us, it's our judgment. That's where our subjectivity lies. That's why our judgment is so important. This is that. That's this, right? Or it could be the affective, the beloved affects, you know? That's me. This feeling. Let me share it with you, please. (laughs) (laughs) Or it could be memory, you know? The good old days, that's when I was, now I'm just kind of hanging around, (laughs) waiting for a better day. It could be sensation. Mm. Or it could be the whole thing, but I'm in my mind. Or subjectivity, and for many, for many psychologists, subjectivity is just being in your mind, right? And intersubjectivity means I'm going to tell you my feelings and you tell me your feelings about me and we'll have a meta discussion about it. That's what intersubjectivity is. (laughs) This is true. This is true. This is true. Well, then one day you become aware of your mind. Oh my God. Maybe it's through a desire too. Oh my God. And then you start to own it. You have to own it all, right? 
then you become aware, and then for that moment, part of you is in awareness, and part of you is looking at the mind for the first time. You're in transition of space, to use Winnicott's beautiful phrase. You're not quite in thought, you're not quite in fantasy, you're not quite in the real, but you're in between it all. But you can actually, your view, and this is not witness conscious, and witness conscious is like looking through a sub, it, true transitional space is a 360 feeling. It's round. It is a bit more round. It's not like peeping through a keyhole and you see a thought. Then, then, that's really great. That is subjectivity. That really is the arising of subjectivity. And with that much, you can actually begin to start actually having an intersubjective experience with another person who's in that. And there's a state that you enter where there's beginning of oneness. Self to self, awareness to awareness. And you're beginning to be in heaven. You know? it happens all the time. Babies, people, dogs, cats. None of this is unusual. It's just the way we think about it is a little unusual. Then you start to, to really like that awareness. You start to fall in love with it. And you start to focus on on it itself. You start to enter awareness. You, you're no longer focusing on the object of your mind. You start going beyond that, aware of your mind, and you start becoming aware of awareness. <laughs> then subjectivity really starts to open up for you. You really start experiencing the openness that is beyond the body. And you can actually feel a connection, a oneness that's not mediated through never-ending language, right? No. What do you mean by that? You know? Then, once you're really in the field, huh? you really are now entering Rigpa. And then as you stay with that, in a cumulative way, if you're just a visitor, this is the sad part of this story, if you're just a visitor, the doors will close behind you. Every time you walk away, the door shuts. And it can shut just as hard as before you opened into it. So one day you're in it, the next day you're out of it. And it's a very state-dependent experience. But touch your foot here for a second. It's a state-dependent experience. It means when you're in it, you're in it, and when you're not in it, you don't even remember it. Raise your hands if you know that. (laughs) So unless it's cumulative, unless you really are a practitioner, a praxis, this stuff will disappear like smoke. It just disappears. So you're always beginning. You are always beginning over and over and over again because you do not have the time. But one day you will. One day you'll get the time. Then you're in hope, right? (coughs) (laughs) So then, then, but if it's cumulative, (coughs) then it starts giving itself to you. And then the kai is open. And then you start actually experiencing these different dimensions coming very rapidly, not, not forever, <coughs> as all the masters tell us. And if you feel connection to great yogis, and you feel connection to lineages, and you feel connection to, <coughs> to different traditions, and you feel to, to the Sambhogakaya realm and all that stuff, it starts opening more and more and more and more. And your subjectivity, you begin to know there's primordial awareness itself, and then annihilation, anxiety starts to disappear. Is that a big deal? That's a big deal. Because annihilation, anxiety runs the show. It does. Almost done. What time is it? So... As awareness of awareness, it becomes a field of multidimensional intensity. And subjectivity extends and expands as it becomes what it is. It extends this way and also extends this way, huh? to use a geometry. And so heaven actually starts to really appear, which we'll call some bogakaya, energies. And <coughs> earth, the light. So primordial openness in you is your is uh, the 
openness of the field. So this openness can cross openness, right? And that is a true into, into subjective experience. You were describing that last week with, uh, with uh, Aaron, where the openness crosses the openness. You with me? And that openness is primordial awareness. Through her, with her, in you and through you. That's what's so great about being a human being. It has a lot of downsides about it. You with me? But this is really fantastic. Really fantastic. So here, <clears throat> samsara and nirvana become one. Meaning, you bring the whole, the whole kit, it's a kit, you with me, of desires, you know, and you bring it with you into this world, and you get bonded, you get attached, you get connected in this world, because this world is divinity itself, and it's manifesting through human beings. And the beatific vision is the human face and animal faces, and you learn to work it with skillful means. And as desire arises, if you can feel that the, whatever the desire is, despicable or undespicable, and we all have the whole range, right? And as soon as you think that you don't have a despicable one in you, you just don't know yourself yet. You don't know yourself yet. And as you, as desires arise in you, and you learn to hold it in psyche, a lot can happen. Of the very intensity of the light growing more and more. So I'm going to now give a guide to desire. So in the fr- some of the frames I've been talking about from a psychoanalytic discourse, which I'm very happy to do, is called the anti-libidinal ego. You've heard that phrase before? So a lot of spirituality is wrapped around the anti-libidinal ego. with me? It's afraid of libidinalness. Life force along the town. And also it can be a reflection of the primitive superego, which is very, very cruel uh, at the extension at moving out into this world. And so a dissociative frame of life can be imposed. A guide to desire. We all await? Almost done. A guide to desire. So desire, as she arises or he arises, it arises, must be held within the field as the field. The more I can have desire here, then it becomes highly functional and very potent. You with me? Now, I don't exactly know what's, how it's all going to unfold, but I do know I have to hold it. Hold it, I don't mean like holding a dog on a chain. You would think, easy, 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 woofer. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, people try and hold it like that, and it really, they lose out, <laughs> dragged around the mud, it bites them and things. But to hold it as your body is the vehicle, as a furnace, as fire, and to hold whatever arises is it, and you hold it and you experience it, is, and you don't let it go into your mind as hope or despair, and you don't start calculating around it, you know, whatever the desire might be, you don't Go into calculative mind. Raise your hands. You don't have to agree with it, but if this makes some sense to you. You don't go into calculative thinking. You don't go into obsessional... You will then then be calculating in in your own mind. We'll use a sexual metaphor. Can you get laid? All the time. Let me see the possibilities. Surely, this is... This is just as you know. One. Or you'll never be laid. <laughs> Another possibility. You think? Just to use a sexual metaphor here. But it's all in your mind. It's in your mind. 
you're evaluating thinking all the time. Or money. You're thinking of money all the time. You you're you're mark up and down and you're evaluating everything in terms of worth. You you have a mercantile approach to human beings. Do you follow? And you're always evaluating in a mercantile way. A little merchant. Five, ten, you know, and you're always evaluating, you know? Got it? So most often than not, desire can be split off from awareness and located within the mind. To each their own on this topic. The mentalization of desire creates fixated states and states of vast frustration. Sex, money, love, family relationships, political stuff. Anyone, any, we could just choose from the, from the infinite possibilities, you know. It's all very relative to one's own self, you know. What's my fixation may not be your fixation, you know. But I do want to know what my fixation is. Because what I am fixated on is not going to happen for me. What I am fixated on will not come into actuality. I mean, it might if I really just, you know, but, but, but at a vast cost. And it probably won't be very wise anyway. <laughs> Raise your hands if this is making some sense what I'm trying to describe here about desire and where she or he or it should be. Right in here, in the heart essence. <clears throat> so, let's skip a little bit here. When you think about desires, you can also go back to the four levels of speech. Okay, And if you want just as we went through the f- different levels of speech, uh, from a vibration to it be- starts becoming a field, and then it becomes has a symbolic, and then it enters words or action, the same thing with desire. You can consider desire itself following the four levels of speech, huh? or the four levels even of mantra. Huh? And the more you can, this is not repression, the more you can simply hold desire, like you're holding it, in a vessel and you feel it in the vessel and you're not trapping it you're feeling it you're experiencing it in that degree activation will take place for you in an unpredictable and unformulated manner but something will arise for you that did not rise before that's where you go into the magical realism of the Vajra Vajrayana Almost, almost. Where is the source of desire? Where does it arise from? It arises in the heart essence traditions from the heart, from the hudayam. Desire arises. All desire arises out of my heart. So, as I start to feel the arising of the desire, I really want to focus on I want to gaze into it. Just like we, yogis gaze into the sky. <clears throat> I don't have much sky around here, so you can gaze into the human heart. And if you gaze, in, you gaze. You don't stare. You don't, you don't, you know, search it down like you're searching for ants, you know, trying to exter... But you gaze into your own heart. In the field, highly activated. And you gaze and you experience the arising of desire, you don't think it, but you know it because you've already assimilated that knowledge beyond the concept that this is the arising of divinity itself. Even if it's murderous. Even if it's murderous. You hold that in your heart. And as it emerges, a true... I won't say a transformation takes place, but the light, it is the light of awareness itself that is manifesting. And as you experience it as the light of awareness, not because you're imposing a belief, but because you're having some direct perception, you will be liberated by the... That is natural liberation. That 
is natural liberation. Natural liberation takes place in the inner heart. Whatever arises, if I'm holding it in the heart and I have geared my perception that I can experience it as the arising, then I am being liberated here and now, right now, through desire and desire itself. Raise your hands if that's making really clear, clear stuff. The source of light is within the tent of the heart, right? That's the source, right? As fusis. Fusis is this beautiful word. It means the emer- it's, it's just surging forth. Champa. It surges forth. It's all surging forth. And you hold it as the emergent luminous energy of primordial awareness manifests. And it manifests, and as you're holding it, it manifests in the great expanse. So that rather than my, my container being ta- small or tall like that, it becomes larger and vaster and vaster. And in that way, I am being liberated through the very desires I have, no matter what, no matter how. And in doing so, I become a human being in a very profound sense. Nothing's foreign to me. What is in me is in you also. <clears throat> and I don't have to demoni- demonicize? Demonize. Demonize. Demon. Demonize. Demonize everyone else so much. So within the heart, at a subtle level, within the heart, the elements are becoming manifest. So as you hold the awareness, you will start experiencing the light and its different colors, the elements, which are the Dakinis also, Maharinisa, and you start experiencing them arising in the manifestation, in the heart, as the self. You with me? As subjectivity manifesting itself. And as you do that, the experiencing of the entire range liberates you and you are becoming the Vajrakramara. The act of creation <laughs> takes place here and now, every moment in my body. The act of creation takes place every moment in my body, in your body, here and now. Just like Baltimore was born, right here, and then you start really experiencing the power of creativity without stretching your brain, figuring out probabilities, and making wagers that probably aren't going to work out anyway. <laughs> Synchronicity starts to take place for you. Wherever awareness is, and if you're in it, your life becomes more in synchronicity. Yeah? That is the magical dimension, the magical realism of the Vajrakalaya in this frame. I hope this is useful for you. Okay. Now, one more thing. So within the heart, the elements manifest in dynamic orientation and resonance. And it, it starts arising in resonance. So you're not sitting encapsulated in your mind, constipated, trying to figure out what's your next step. But out of resonance, a lot starts taking place for you naturally because you're living in resonance, right? And as you live in resonance, things start unfolding naturally without so much god-awful effort, okay? The psyche herself begins to be experienced as drops. So the drops, of me- the drop is not only the bodhicitta drop, but the entire heart is spheres, S-P-H-E-R-E-S, like drops and configurations of the luminous energy throughout the ba- body of light. And they start, you start feeling them more and more manifesting in your body in kind of a liquidity sort of way. <clears throat> the body of light is hidden and also unexplicit within human beings so often that one is only experiencing desire in its most manifested state and also mostly in the mind. So you don't really experience the, the, the unfolding. And it's in the unfolding of creation itself, Dharmakaya, then some Bogakaya, then Numanakaya, as me, that the drama takes place right here, right, right here. 
So, to become aware of desire in the heart and to integrate desire into the heart allows for desire to bring forth what might be brought forth. So, what that also means is I'm not sure what is going to be brought forth, okay? You, that's part of the deal. So, as she starts to rise, she, as the Kundalini starts to rise, and I'm feeling it may have a very, very hard, vicious, wild, unbound, ghastly, demonic feel to it. You with me? But I hold it without precluding it, without foreclosing it, and I hold it. And what it will arise, I'm not sure, because it's unpredictable, unformulated, and I am staying with that experience. I'm holding it in the, in the light of awareness. And I'm also holding it in the self-object functions. If I do it without self-object functions, it'll wrap me up, and I'll be wrapped around it prematurely. What are the self-object functions? All those things, beings and people we extend to. This causes lots of people lots of problems, desire. You with me? Either too much or not enough, okay? So to become aware of desire in the heart and to integrate desire into the heart allows for desire to bring forth what might be brought forth. Then you're really relating to the divine manifestation. Do you follow this? Now, desire is a subtle configuration. And also the functions of the Dakini take place within this. And some is amplification. So sometimes you amplify it. Sometimes you pacify it a little bit. This is really getting a little too much for me here. So you learn to pacify it. You know, you don't foreclose it. You sort of like pet it. Easy, easy, easy. Okay? You magnetize with it. You want to feel it coming through your body. Well, what happens as it comes around you? Feel it beyond your body. You magnetize it. What is brought forth? What is brought forth? And third, it invokes. It's another word they use. Actually, it awakens it further in yourself. It'll work in other dimensions. So, and finally, there's a transmission of desire through heart essence of the great expanse. And so it really does happen. We can transmit desire through our mind but we can also transmit the desire of awakening through our heart with each other, right? That's what the great yogis do. And ordinary little yogis, they transmit the desire for awakening from one person to another, right? <sighs> desire. Fixated state. Clear space. Clear space. So we're going to close our eyes for a few minutes. And you can answer your own questions because you're have just as many opinions as I do, probably. So have your own opinions. Have your own opinions. You know who said that? Lord Buddha said that. He says, have your own opinions. Don't listen to the oral tradition. He said that in the Pali scriptures, don't listen to the oral tradition. Really, hear the words spoken. Hear them as provocative statements. Then, Come to terms with them yourself. Take your karma into your own hands, which is your dharma meeting you, and then s see how it unfolds. See what happens. See if it works for you or not. See if you become brighter and lighter. See what happens. Now, this one I don't know if it's true or not. The other words I knew because I've read them in the scriptures. Still may not know if it's true or not. <laughs> but he's dying. Everyone's really feeling bad. Don't go, don't go. And he says, light your own fire. Light your own fire. So, with this topic, definitely with this topic, have your own opinions. So we'll sit for a while and we'll focus <coughs> on awareness. And we'll hold awareness together. And we'll extend to each other. And if a certain uh, group of desires have been in your mind, 
Let's take them from the mind and bring them into the heart. Just bring. I'm not talking about praying and begging either. Are you with me? Just take them from your mind and bring them into the heart, whatever that might be. The inner heart essence. Now, notice if your mind, your actual mind is clear at this moment. Notice if there's space, a non-conceptual state arising for you. And not that we're always going to be non-conceptual, but in this particular task, you really do want to bring the content, the mind, into your heart essence. This is totally private. Let yourself feel the desire there. Just feel it. And feeling is a, dou- is a double entendre word. In the poor, poor West, we equate feelings with affects or emotions. You with me? And in the East, it's really a perception. You know, you feel it as perception. Perception. Feel it. <laughs> For those of who, who you like to, you could feel you, yourself as the deity holding this without going into imagination. Or the Dakini. Or you may have the capacity to go into just pure awareness. When you bring it into pure awareness, it's not to dissolve it as in get rid of it. It's more alchemical than that. Now, if you'd like, we're going fast, extend the feel through your body a bit more and allow a little intensification to take place. Both vertically and horizontally.
extend yourself into the immediacy of the situation to us, just this group right here. Extend yourself into the generational field with the same light of Extend yourself into the great yogis you know and love, the great gurus. Feel your oneness. Extend yourself into the various traditions that you participate in. And then for our purposes here, extend yourself to the Dakini Dujo Yodroma. Stay awake. Feel the power of the configuration in your body. For a moment, access the beneficent dimension of the energy. Access that. It's beneficent deities or energies. And then access, invoke the fierce one. Let them mix in your body. As you do that, feel feel the dimension of timeless awareness. And how it holds time. Feel both dimensions of which are your which is awareness itself. Just notice what your experience is like. Notice what it's like just to go to that simple, <coughs> very, very skillful means of working with your awareness at the level of psyche <laughs> and not simply our mind. <coughs> and then you can wonder, <coughs> is this really a good way to go about it for yourself? <coughs> and that just maybe trying to figure things out the other way may not be as useful as this. Or at least <coughs> being really grounded in psyche, really grounded in psyche.
<coughs> now, if you like, we're going to just, and like, if you don't mind, you can just share your experience. If you happen to find yourself in timeless awareness and time at the same time. And Steve, would you take the microphone to me? Did anybody find themselves at that moment in time and timelessness? Anybody find themselves there? Okay, I'm going to have uh, first a lady right there, his eyes are closed. Would you mind sharing? In the yes. Well, when you say the words time and timelessness, I go into confusion. But what I did experience was um, tremendous sturdiness and openness at the same time. And um, physicality and non-physicality at the same time. And surges of um, life force flowing through. And then as I sat with that, I felt information from the field coming that seemed to relate to the desires I had put into my heart. Great. Thank you so much. <coughs> and uh, Mimi, just a brief description of what that was like for you. But the best way I could describe it is it was like there was um, two distinct, I'm going to use the word objects, um, like c coming, um, that I was becoming aware of. And as those two distinct objects, I'm going to use, uh, co like coalesced within my, my body, what emerged was around the round, around, um, and an openness, and then from that, what kept emerging was um, m more roundness. Uh, it just kept getting round, more round. Thank you very, very much. Really useful. Uh, the lady next to you, right here, Carol. Oh. Do you mind describing, <coughs> especially at the end point? Um, <coughs> what I uh, felt arising is this um, expanded um, sphere opening and opening in, and an elation, just um, uh, what's that? Just that um, no, elation sound feels right. Like the right word, just elated to um, and and really present, really present. So I guess that's in time <laughs> to the unfo unfolding of the moment, and that. And then into that expanded sense of um, everything at once. Yes. Timeless awareness is presence in time. It is primordial presence. Wow. It is presence in time. I just thank you. It. it I feel phenomenal. The <laughs> next person, you're just going to describe your experience. Just your experience, or phenomenologist, just what did you experience? Actually, at first it felt very uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. When I first uh, like tried to put the desire in my heart. Mm -hmm. And then it started um, feeling more peaceful mm -hmm. and expansive. And there is a certain, certain degree of objectivity mm -hmm. arised and feels, then it suddenly feels like neutral. Mm -hmm. 
what could you describe what that word neutral feels like? Just what does that feel like, that, that place? <clears throat> like without being stretched in a certain direction. And cool. Like feeling... I guess that's a kind of... Like feeling both in the desire and out of the desire at the, at same, the same time. time. Great. Yes. That beautifully said without being stretched in any direction. Thank you. Next person, just the experience. Just your experience. <coughs> At the end, I was just left with, and I still feel it, just empty mind, just spreading emptiness. And what had happened was that the desire was really clear, dropped down from my thoughts into my heart, and it became wrapped in all the elements in my heart, in each one, one at a time. And what popped up after that was the exact opposite of that desire, which I didn't want. <laughs> <laughs> but that became wrapped in each of the el elements with excruciating discomfort and, and intensity. Um, and then the elements started exploding out of my, my heart, out like fire, like sparks out mm -hmm. of my body. Um, and that's when I just felt this incredible emptiness of my mind, and I still feel it. Thank you so much. We're going to just pause for a second. <clears throat> and the next person, just briefly describe your experience, if you don't mind, just staying exactly experientially near. Well, I'm, I'm exhausted this morning. I spent <laughs> spend the weekend with my grandson, taking mm -hmm. care of him by myself for four days. And, mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, so my, my desire was to not be tired. And when I was fighting with that, when you're talking, and you said to go in, and I realized that well, I was I was resisting the tiredness, and so I couldn't allow the energy to come in that would make me not tired. So I just let go of that, and, and then I dropped in. I could feel that dropping into my heart, and it was kind of a it, everything was fluid, you know. When you you were talking about how we how we we bring the desire into our heart, it kind of transforms into like like the flow, going with the flow of things. So everything was fluid. <coughs> And I was I was tremendously confused about how it was going to get resolved, but I was sure and without any doubt that it was going to get resolved. And so it was holding that doubt and the certainty at the same time. And, and, then, and now I still have the fatigue, but it feels it feels soft, and I can just kind of relax in it and not have to fight. Thank you so much. Next person. And just describing your experience. <laughs> um, first, I, I put the desire was um, in my mind, and it was uncomfortable. And it, when it dropped down into my heart, at first it was um, very localized, and then, and and just. A, a minute, it, it spread out and mm -hmm. it became very spacious and very light and very um, just spacious. And then um, I started to get information and a kind of um, energetic kind of feeling of what the energy, like the content went away totally, mm -hmm. but the energy of what the the desire was was there in a very... Um, in a very spacious way. Beautifully described, thank you. We're gonna pause again for a minute. <coughs> a little of a space, just for a second. <coughs> Next, would you mind describing your experience, please? I really like the phrase of neutrality that mm -hmm. just sort of ex it, um, explains <coughs> how I felt and I went, <coughs> immediately into neutrality with mm -hmm. just kind of like expectation, no expectation. 
And then um, when it dropped into my heart, a surprise was that jewels kept popping out. And they became colors, and they became energy. And I thought, huh, there really is such a thing as that. But I didn't want to think about it. So I just, again, went into neutrality and just the whole time was just these incredible jewels, colors, feelings. Um, they were, they would expand and then not, and that's just how my heart was. <coughs> Beautiful description, thank you so much. Next person. I was feeling um, just mostly a kind of open, being in an open space that didn't have a lot of variation, just kind of holding openness in my heart and uh, not moving into desire and not moving into judgment and um, um, it was uh, very soothing and comfortable. Thank you so much. Next person. <coughs> Uh, my experience is uh, cumulative. It started uh, this morning before we came here with Tom and I uh, talking. Uh, and I was describing to him a desire to be around a certain kind of personality type that uh, sort of was lighthearted and jovial and humorous. And as I uh, held that desire, in the field that came to me was that what I was really desiring was some freedom from some uh, was kind of emotional pain. Mm -hmm. And then when that came into my awareness and I held that in the field, um, that emotional pain dissolved into the Dormakaya. It just, it, it dissolved into, it was like the fuel that opened up uh, infinite space in the dark space. <clears throat> Thank you so much, and I love your description of gazing. <clears throat> and we we spent a lot of time before. We've had wonderful lamas come and <clears throat> give us many gazing uh, empowerments and gazing instructions. <clears throat> and so gazing <clears throat> is really part of this, huh? This gazing, and so gazing into the sky is really great and useful, but also in this day and age, just gazing also into our own heart essence, is equally useful. And then also gazing into the hearts of other human beings is equally as useful in this highly relational, highly Saturnian period of life. Huh? <clears throat> A highly democratic time. In, and democracy, which is not just people voting on a Tuesday morning, but is actually a field, you with me? released in particular time and space and that's taking place in this period and we're really fortunate to be people who are in a transition to democracy and democracy is not only in terms of governments and not only in terms of healing but also in terms of divinity itself thank you next person um, for me, when uh, I drop the desire into my heart, um, it just uh, it softened and it got more uh, present, you know, like not future, but just in the present. And the, it was much simpler, like little things that would happen in the very present moment were there and... It got juicy and um, filled with kind of so much more myriad of sparkling energy and possibility, um, more limitless, uh, less confined. Um. I love your phrasing. It's really helpful for all of us in terms of potential space, huh? uh, potential condition, which is the very nature of we'll have one more and then we're going to do a group experience before we end up so one more sh one more person or just articulating your experience just as it is I was aware initially with the desire in my mind just 
I uh, what came up was for me was um, just the tightness and um, fear around <coughs> the mind in that tight space, mm -hmm. and then that dropping into the heart just felt. Um, it wasn't that the fear totally dissolved, um, but there was just that drop into this expanse and open, and um, there was a um, a shift into sort of more dissolving. I could feel that fear shifting, and as you invoked sort of the Dakini energy, the beneficence and also the fierceness. Um, the beneficence, I felt this, just that warm, um, sweet, um, even further kind of melting in my heart. And, and the fierceness really... Um, both were working together in, I felt, just kind of releasing more of that um, the fear-based piece that I was with. Great. Thank you so much. So we're going to pause now, and we're going to have a meditation again now for the, for the next 15 minutes, okay? And I may ask one or two people to walk around and just touch people. We're going to raise the energy a little bit more. And we'll put a, a, a chant on. <coughs> Probably be a secular song again. So we're just going to hold awareness. And I'm going to... Uh, we're going to do this now, okay? So if you're going to the bathroom, you can come down also. So we're going to Let's go enter awareness again. <coughs> and we're going to turn the... If you buy a light, turn the light off. Thank you. Thanks. I would turn a big light off. That's great. I would turn that light off. That'd be great. And I'll ask you to walk around and work the energy. If you don't feel well, don't do it, okay? Uh, yeah, right. That's great. Thanks so much, man. All the way off. Be great. We're just going to sit. We're going to focus on the inner heart. And let's let's focus on the on the heart again. You to extend down into the ground. From your heart down through the perineum and the sexual center into the earth. And you can come all the way back up through the heart, through the throat, <coughs> palate of the mouth, top of your head, going up to the Brahma, the Nada string. Focusing in the inner heart essence. <coughs> if you like, use the Dakini mantra, Oma Hung. Hung Yana Dakini Bam. Maharani Sasiri Hung. Om Yana Dakini Bam. Maharani Sasiri Hung. Is Aaron and Michelle don't mind walking around and touching people this morning? And Elizabeth, if you don't mind. And Karen, you feel okay? I'm just gonna walk around. I'm just gonna, you wanna 
focus the energy. People are going to touch us a little bit, a little stretchy. Desire is a very uh, topic that consumes a lot of space and energy and light. It just consumes it to its to its place in its home place. So the more we can place it in the heart, the more energy and light arises. And the more it's outside of that sphere, S P H E R E. It can be very consumptive. So let's stay with the awareness state. When a person comes towards you, you extend the light to them also. Extend to Vakini, Divine Mother again. <coughs> who manifests in all different levels of our awareness. If you if you actually have a if you suffer from anger, or rage, it's really useful to bring it into the heart essence. If you foreclose it, try and push it away, you become a sheep. No vital energy. If you just act it out all the time. It'll bring you into impotency in your situations. If you integrate it, you're integrating light itself, fire in your field. Pamasambhava, <coughs> Unchempa. Swami Muktananda, Yen Chin, Lama Norla, Mandora, Dujan Rinpoche, Ama, and to you, your own, whoever that might be, Kunzain Dekjan Rinpa. multi-dimensional life. And this may sound like magic to you today, and you probably won't believe it. You don't have to believe it, but to experiment with the alchemical process. Or you bring everything into your heart. And then you don't have to whine to yourself so much, which is really not good. It weaken it weakens you. It weakens me, you know.
gives us become uh, victims of fear. Both the guru, Pramodhu guru, the light of awareness revealing itself to us. A lot of times, when we think the law is outside of ourself, there's a lot of fear. Unborn, undying. If you have trouble invoking these, or entering into it, finding it, then really doing some of the practices are really useful. They're metaphorical texts that invoke through metaphor what they're describing. At this moment, you guys can extend to me and I'll extend to you. It's not that it's anything special about that, but it does help focus the matrix in another way. Because if you're all extending to me, you'll all be extending to yourself, actually. So, that's... So extend to me, please. Sustain your extension. So then you can practice a pass through with me if you don't mind. Like you're gonna, like you're just gonna go right through this person, with the openness <coughs> and unboundedness. You're gonna pass through like a doorway. As you learn through extension, which is resonance, is the openness, opening to the openness in all phenomena, then as you, as it, 
as it evolves into passing through phenomena, you'll be able to pass through another person, intensifying the light, which is love, but more also you'll be able to pass through situations. Are you with me? Not in a dissociative state, but in the body of light, you can pass through difficult situations. The more you take the authority into your own self, then confidence will arise. <clears throat> as long as you place the confidence in someone outside of yourself, it will arise for you in them, <laughs> but not for you in you. We all know that, right? With that, we'll start to end our session. We can rub our hands together, place it on our hearts. I would like everybody to, to practice th this, these sequences this week. Part of being in the seminar is your agreement to meditate on a regular basis, okay? Many of you still aren't doing that. It really is part. I'm all for movement. I'm all for dance. I'm all for everything. But I would, but there is a place of just sitting that has its own fruition. Are you with me? <clears throat> I love Qigong. I do Qigong. <laughs> but there is a place for just sitting in the stillness and movement that takes place. That is part of our agreement for being in the seminar. As you stay in the seminar, those who want to, this is not for everybody, <clears throat> then I would like everyone to meditate on a regular basis, more than 10 minutes, okay? 10 minutes, my mind is, I, I, I have to go to the bathroom in 10 minutes, okay? But I'd really like you to put some time. This will not last forever. Mm -hmm. with me? I'm telling you. So let's use it while the seminar is here. And give yourself a participation in it, which is not just sitting in this room, but you allow yourself for at least 40 minutes of meditating every day. Then you will understand why you cannot sit as you do sit for 40 minutes. You will understand why you have to, to get up. Then it will be open to you what's agitating you. As Lacan says, the unconscious agitates me. Everybody okay with this? So we're, we're trying to move this ahead to keep moving. Thank you so much. Take it easy. See you later.